Let's move on. Talk about the rubber dam. We all should be using that. We have to be using that. An illustrated case for you here of this nice uh, case that was started here. We see files in the molar tooth. We know there's not a rubber dam on this case, but yet there's files in the tooth. We're taking a lot of risks. He's not using a split dam technique because there's no tooth behind it to split uh, rubber dam off of. So how is this endo being done with no rubber dam? How are the solutions? How are we irrigating properly if there's no rubber dam? How is the saliva not getting in the tooth with no rubber dam? We can use these lovely scare tacks and say, well, if you don't use a rubber dam, your patient's going to aspirate the file. But how often does this really happen? Probably not very often. And those people that choose to do endodontics without the rubber dam are certainly willing to take this risk as opposed to using rubber dam. This is why we should all be using the rubber dam. This is what's in one milliliter of saliva. This, these bacteria are just waiting to get into your case and causing your treatment to fail. So this is the main reason why we're using rubber dam is to follow an aseptic protocol. In a vital case, let's say I'm short. Let's say I can't get down to length and the case is vital. If I've maintained an aseptic protocol, there's a good chance that that case is going to work because I did not introduce bacteria into the mix. If I'm working in a crowded case and I'm short, different story because now we have infected tissue inside that tooth. But in a, in a vital case, if I'm practicing strict aseptic protocol and I and run into some problem that I can't correct, the odds of that tooth not working are slim. Still has potential, but less potential. Then we have this something called the isolite. I, used to, I was taking this out of my presentations until the last one I gave in Vancouver when someone says, well, I use the isolite. Is that OK? Well, so I threw it back in because people are using this for endodontic procedures. This is not enough to isolate the tooth and prevent an, or to keep an aseptic field. So if you're using it, it's a great device for operative dentistry, things like that, but not strictly for doing endo. If you want to put it in there with your rubber dam, great. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you certainly can try. In 2010, the American Association of Endodontists released a position statement on the rubber dam. Prior to 2010, the rubber dam was a suggested standard of care. Well, now since 2010, since the American Association of Endodontists has released this position paper, it is now the legal standard of care to use a rubber dam. So you can be sure that if you're not using a rubber dam, you're practicing below the legal standard of care. Types of retainers, I've heard a lot of clinicians talk, especially the last course I went to, saying you have to use these winged retainers, you have to use this specific retainer. Well, I got a lot of retainers in my office. I practice with a partner, so he likes different ones than I like. I like the wingless ones. There's not many cases I can't get through with these three retainers. We've got the number W8A for molars, W2A for premolars, and the number 9 for anterior teeth. I can treat 90% of my cases with one of these three clamps. And, and I don't call them clamps in my office. I ask the, the terminology to be called a retainer because nobody wants to have a clamp on their tooth. They'd rather have a retainer on their tooth. So terminology is a big thing. It's a psychological thing. So if I ask for a different retainer, I say, I'll take the number nine retainer. I say, don't grab me the number nine clamp because the, the terminology is too harsh and too rough. You can also do something called a split dam technique. You don't even need to use a rubber dam retainer. But you can also use more than one rubber dam retainer. There's a lot of different creative ways you can use the rubber dam as long as you're isolating that tooth properly. So this is the placement of a rubber dam. I'm going to show you a couple little techniques that I think uh, that, I, that I use now because of lessons that I've learned. So basically, a proper an a rubber dam can be placed on a tooth without anesthesia. This is my assistant. She volunteered for this. We're placing the rubber dam over a non-anesthetized tooth. And we're just working around the tooth itself. But what I want to show you here is as I'm manipulating that rubber dam, and as soon as that rubber dam forceps leaves that retainer, my finger's on that. I don't want it to pop off. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to manipulate that rubber dam around my retainer and around my frame. And you're going to see my finger, in some capacity, is going to stay on the back of that retainer. Why? Because as I stretch that latex or non-latex rubber dam over that retainer, if it's not on there tight enough, it's going to fling off. And in 2007, I had a rubber dam come from a lower molar tooth and chip person's number eight. They weren't very happy with me when that rubber dam retainer popped off. So I've learned my lesson, and I'm telling that to you. When you're manipulating that rubber dam in any capacity, make sure you keep some finger on that rubber dam. Once you slide that rubber dam frame on, it's going to flip over that patient's nose. They're going to feel very claustrophobic. Do not cover their nose with that rubber dam. Take a couple seconds, take a scissors, and cut right around where their nose is so they can continue to breathe. If a patient has trouble breathing through their nose, Make a little small opening on the contralateral side of the tooth you're working with so they can breathe through their mouth. I'm using that rubber dam. I've never done a root canal without it in the, what, 14 years now that I've been practicing dentistry as a general dentist or an endodontist because it has to be used. If somebody says, well, I can't tolerate the rubber dam, I say, well, then you may have to get your tooth extracted. People then will tolerate the rubber dam. 
if they know that that's the only way that they can save their tooth. And I never let a patient tell me or dictate their treatment to me. If they don't want to follow my rules, then they can either go to somewhere else that they feel comfortable not using rubber dam, or they can have their tooth removed. I think the biggest frustration with rubber dam is this is what we're taught in dental school, that each tooth has to have a single hole for this tooth to come through. Uh, and have it isolated properly and we have to invert the rubber dam. I was never really good at that. So I, I prefer the split damming technique where I'll just put one big slit in the rubber dam and I'll isolate multiple teeth. And I love multiple tooth isolation. But we also have to consider sealing off those ports of the parts of the rubber dam with a sealing agent. For that I use a product uh, called Oraseal sold by Ultradent. It comes in a putty form. I like the putty form, so a little bit, uh, it's not as thick, and, but they also have the, uh, the caulking agent as well. So what we do here is after we have split dam, and again, I love split dams because I love seeing multiple teeth in my area of access. It helps me stay on track with the pulp chamber, and this is in live. We just kind of squeeze it all around the tooth, and this helps me seal it. That way I don't have to punch an individual hole for each tooth. It's a very easy way to do it. And all we do is just take a little cotton pellet. This is all in real time, too. So there's, it doesn't take long to do this. It ensures me that I can have an aseptic field. And we just kind of mush it in. And when we're done with the treatment and take the rubber dam off, we just take an air water syringe and spray down the area and rinses right off. If we don't get it all, well, then we can take a toothbrush and rinse it off, too.